Okay, welcome everybody. This is a first Wednesday. Um, we do it as a first Wednesday of every month. Different topics, different ways. It's a little bit of an experiment tonight. Uh, we're going to have Erica Berry talking about this terrific book, Wolfish. I'll say a little bit about it uh, in a minute. Uh, and there'll be a book signing afterwards. And in addition to that, we're going to ask you a whole question. She'll talk about the book and some of her ideas. And it, it'll bring up a lot of topics, including how we deal with big, fierce animals that might scare us, that are also important to conservation. So we'll have a little bit of a panel discussion, and you can ask questions of Erica and the panel. And then afterwards, uh, if you've been here before, you know we go outside, uh, walk out there, and you do artworks, you have conversations, free drinks for everybody, and conversation about everything that's going on. Um, I want to just emphasize our sponsors, The Courtyard by Marriott, Stephen Brenda Olson and their uh, foundation, and also a big shout out to Relist Wolves, which is kind of a grass roots organization that really cares about wolves, um, and they wanted to support tonight's talk. So what I like about this book, look, at I, I read this book, and it's, it's um, I love wolves for scientific reasons, because I've studied them. But as a kid, some wolves came to mean I, I wasn't a very good biologist as a kid because I grew up in upstate New York and I go camping and think that I was going to see a wolf, but I never did. But to me, they symbolized sort of beauty and wild. So I just had this fantasy that if, if I would go camping, you know, 200 miles north of New York City, I was going to see a wolf. My dream is maybe that'll be true for uh, the next generation. Uh, but it's also a really great book. It's, it's, I don't know how to say it other than it's a really intimate book. Um, there's a lot of, it's not, you'll know, I don't want to steal her, your thunder, Erica, but it's, it's um, I just happen to believe, working at the aquarium, that how we interact and treat and are with animals teaches a lot, teaches a lot about how we are with each other and just how we can just be better in general. Um, and the book has a lot of that in it. It has a lot of talk about fear and sort of misjudgment of others. Uh, there are just a lot of stories in here that resonated. Erica, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you all so much for coming, and I'm so sorry for bringing the rain from Oregon. I promise it will be done soon. I just have a feeling. Um, thank you to Realist Wolves. It's such a pleasure to be here, and as well to Adina and everyone who worked behind the stage at the aquarium. Um, and to Peter, Jackie, and Eli Seba for this panel that we're gonna get to soon. Um, I'm thrilled to be in Long Beach and not just because I'm hopefully seeing the sun for the first time in weeks. Um, so a friend recently asked me, like, you're talking about wolves at an aquarium, huh? And I think, you know, whether we're looking at wolves or at sea stars, there's actually the same thing going on, which is we're flexing this muscle of peering closely at another creature that occupies this world that is not us, right? Um, there's this real gateway to curiosity and wonder that can happen when you imagine what is it like to move through the days, the seasons, the world in another body, right? Um, I recently learned the term spark bird. Any birders in the crowd? You might know this term. I'm an aspirational birder, so I, this is about all I know about birding. However, I do think that the wolf was my spark bird. It got birding. It's the, the bird that gets you interested in birding. And when I began studying wolves about 10 years ago and our stories with them, it made me care deeply about all other creatures. And I think that's the beauty of the aquarium too. Like you go in front of a tank and you're having an experience with another animal. So, um, yeah, thank you. I think as we're, as we're facing the endangerment of so many species on sea and in land, it's more important than ever that we learn to see these creatures not just for who they are in relation to us, but who they are when we're not there, right? So my book, Wolfish, um, this is the British cover and the American cover. They're slightly different, which is interesting. It began as an environmental studies thesis when I was an undergraduate a decade ago. And it's about real wolves coming back to my home state of Oregon, but it's also about centuries of symbolic wolves and my own reckoning with what they represent, with what I'd been told they represent, which was very often this kind of scary creature, the idiom, the wolf at the door, right? These fairy tales, that was sort of the shadow wolf that was in my head. 
So before this wonderful panel kicks off, I'm just gonna read you a short excerpt, uh, just a paragraph to ground you in my approach. I'm gonna ask you all a question that will require your cell phones very briefly. And then I'm gonna debunk three common misconceptions about wolves. My goal is that when you all leave here and you go to your dinner parties and are talking about wolves, which I know you all do all the time, um, you will have things to bring up when somebody says, but I think I'm afraid of hiking with around a wolf or isn't this a scary thing to happen? I think we really need new narratives around wolves and I'm hoping to enter that conversation with you all. So, the book opens with a scene where I'm discussing the discovery of a poached wolf in northeastern Oregon, my home state. Um, there was actually a whole pack was found poisoned in the woods. And I talked to a forensic animal pathologist whose job it is to study their bodies and figure out what has killed this animal. The story I was trying to figure out was not what or who killed the wolf, but why and how? Why, in a time and place where wolves present no tangible threat to human safety, does a human kill one wolf or eight in the middle of a forest? In other words, what, when the shooter looked down the barrel of the gun, did he see? And when I imagined encountering a wolf in the forest, what did I see? There is always the creature in front of you and the creature in your mind. What shadows have we stitched for the wolf? This book is interested in the real life of the Canis lupus, but also in examining the body of that symbolic wolf. She is a piece of cultural taxidermy, fabricated by humans with parts gathered across time and space and howling first and foremost in our heads. The symbolic wolf is enormous. She appears screen printed beneath the gold moon on the tourist shop t-shirt in the lone wolf terrorist headline, blowing down the straw house of the three little pigs in Adolf Hitler's Eastern Front headquarters, which was dubbed the wolf's lair, in Twilight and Game of Thrones, and in the Lakota term for a wolf's day, which is called such because she has created the fog and wind desired by traveling warriors. Because this symbolic wolf roams inside our minds, she looks different to me than she does to you. We have all been taught a certain kind of wolf. Very often we have absorbed her like osmosis. The wolf does not live apart from us in some pure wild space, but increasingly she lives beside us. And to look at what it means to share habitat with the wolf is to consider how we share it with all fellow beings, human and animal and other. Research suggests that wolves howl as a mode of connection. A wolf will howl after feeding, but also sometimes out of loneliness. This book is both the howl you make when you think you are alone and the howl that answers to remind you that you are not. Let this book be an invitation. See the tracks in the snow the size of your palm. Notice how they make your heart feel. Walk with me. Stop there. So I was very aware growing up that many people had misconceptions about wolves because they were existing very close to my life. This is an image of my grandfather on his Oregon sheep farm. And his brother was a Sierra Club president. He took me on conservationist trips. He was someone who believed that wild creatures really had a space in the forest and that also she, uh, you know, there was a place for sheep and that they could coexist if you were managing them well. On the other side of my family in Montana, I have some relatives who are big game hunters who feel a little bit less like wolves have a place in the wilderness. Um, and I think my research in many ways began when I saw a sticker on an uncle's truck that referred to wolves as government-sponsored terrorism. And I was trying to figure out why the wolf was conjuring this, and I'm a non-confrontational person, so I thought rather than ask my uncle, I should just embark on a 10-year project about it. <laughs> um, that's definitely the easy way out. Um, and I was trying to figure out why is the wolf conjuring so much anger and fear. This billboard is a picture I took about 10 years ago in Eastern Oregon that was paid for by a local anti-wolf sort of cattleman's organization. And I think it's worth pointing out, like, everyone, the truth that they have about wolves is different than the truth that I had about wolves is different than the scientists. And so there's so much misinformation about wolves. And um, 
yeah, I became really interested in those stories. I thought, to tell the right story about the wolf, we kind of have to look at some of these wrong stories, too. OK, some of you may have done this before. I'm going to ask you to take out your phones for just 30 seconds, go to slido.com, enter this number, and then just as you generate answers, they will sort of appear in this waterfall of wolf-related ideas. And what I want us all to think about for a minute, as I wrote, we all have kind of a different wolf in our head. And when you think about wolves, what is coming to mind, whether real wolves or wolves in fiction? OK, Twilight Heads, you are here. Um, <laughs> Twilight, again, cute beauty. I mean, these words are interesting, right? Mysterious, majestic, the idea of pack versus the idea of solo. A lot of t-shirts reference that I need to research. There's so many good wolf songs. We could have, we had this beautiful wolves howling, but the wolf, my wolf playlist on Spotify is really robust right now. Okay, so you get the sense, right? Majestic is right now one of the most common words which I think is really interesting. So it was Little Red Riding Hood, right? OK. This is, this is like the table of contents for my book. You are doing all of the work here. These are all the ideas that I talk about. Um, I'm going to cut you off. I'm so sorry. I could just watch this all day. We will talk about this afterwards, all of these associations. Aliens, like I need to hear the story behind that. OK. So you'll notice that one of the most common associations was Little Red Riding Hood. Who maybe read an old book like this? This looked familiar, like children's books. Now there's very many like amazing Little Red Riding Hood recreations that are more sort of progressive. But I think this was the story that I was originally quite bothered by because I thought it's really not fair to the wolf. But it's also not fair to Little Red Riding Hood. And as Peter mentioned, my book does not just look at wolves. It also looks at my relationship to the wolf and who am I as a young woman in relation to the wolf and how do I think about fear um, as someone who likes to go exploring and likes to go walk in the woods. Um, it's not just Western European folk tales that have wolves depicted in ways that are dangerous. You have words in Prussian and Iranian and Sanskrit that use the same word for wolf as outlaw. So you can trace it back linguistically like, these conflations of wolves and the sort of evil man or outsider go back really, really far. And at the same time, you have indigenous testimonies that really suggest that wolves and early humans lived symbiotic, entangled lives. You know, there's a lot of evidence that each species saw something that they could learn from the other. And even the idea that, you know, perhaps humans learned hunting techniques from wolves. We were watching them. We've always been watching wolves, right? And much of the language that indigenous peoples have used to describe wolves hints at this close relationship. These are words like brother, grandfather, relative, companion, right? And yet, the wolf's legacy as this symbol of danger, this beast to vanquish, this human foe, is really persistent as the dominant Euro-American story. And that's the sort of big bad wolf that I focus on in this book, just because it's the one I'm most familiar with. And it has the most cultural sway. So, this is a sort of cultural core sample of what the wolf might conjure. This is basically what you find when you start Google searching wolf. Um, I'm not gonna do a close reading of all of these images. We could talk about them for a long time. I will say the third image was, I took it, um, I was at a wolf sanctuary in England and this was a wolf that they would walk. Um, and it, this is the wolf going to the bathroom and it's by these kind of toadstool. It was really like a fairy tale come to life in this sort of surreal way where wolves are living in this old historic English estate. Um, so I'm interested in what all of these other narratives are. The first bounty placed on a wolf's head may have been in sixth century Greece. This is a quote from a British scholar who says the wolf is the only animal, right, that has had this bounty, this criminal reputation, why do we look at an animal and see it as a criminal? That says something about how we relate to animals, but also how we relate to each other, right? How we relate to the idea of the criminal. And I think, you know, I was struggling with fear and anxiety in my own life um, when I started researching 
this book. Um, and I didn't think that was connected to the wolves at first. And then I realized that so many of the stories I heard about wolves, so many of these idioms, these ideas, the wolf is at the door, those are really also speaking about our relationship with fear. And I felt like to untangle our relationship with the wolf, we really had to look at our relationship with anxiety um, and those connections. So, okay, misunderstanding number one, this is your dinner party number one piece of fodder. Who has heard this idea that wolves are bloodthirsty, that they're killers, that they're, it's a pretty common idea. And yet, I think this idea is really amplified by this news headline, which was from the Central Park Five case in New York City in the late 80s, where a group of mostly black men were wrongfully convicted of murdering a white woman jogger. And they were compared to a wolf pack. And when I heard this, I thought this is not only deeply unfair to the people, but it's unfair to the wolves, right? Because a, it implies that a wolf pack is going to just attack a lone woman in the forest. And that idea is harmful. And I think this gets to a theme that I really think about through the book, which is that when we tell harmful stories about wolves, they're harming not just our relationship with this amazing animal, but also with each other, right? We're appropriating them very often. Our wrongful ideas about wolves have impacts on our human life too. Okay, so what's the truth behind, this is also me at the same wolf sanctuary feeding a wolf. They would get sort of roadkill from the side of the, the British highways and they would bring it in and the sound of a wolf chomping through a bone is incredible. And you remember like, this is not a dog. It looks like a dog sometimes. He acts like a dog and yet the way that the bones are, like this is an amazing creature that also is not gonna come up to me and play with me in the same way that a dog would. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the relationship of the dog and the wolf I think has to do with our relationship with wolves now that is so fraught. But so wolves are amazing hunters. Um, many of you have probably maybe seen them circling prey in a nature documentary. The sort of choreography of a pack moving is so beautiful to watch. But I think one thing that we have to remember is that more than nine times out of 10, the prey will escape. We don't often hear about that. Like wolves are amazing hunters, but their prey are amazing too. And I was talking to a biologist in Wyoming, interviewing him, and he said, I had this one wolf that was so fierce. It was this like huge, strong wolf. And one day he gets a mortality signal from its radio collar. So he goes out and he follows it, the signal out, out to the middle of a snowy field where there's one wolf lying in the middle of a patch of snow. And there's a circle dots of blood around this wolf and there's two holes in the side of the wolf's body. And he puts on his like detective cap and is like, what has happened to this wolf? And he figures out that an elk skewered it and spun it around in their fight and flung the wolf. And he said to me, we forget that the prey are pretty badass too. We have to give the prey more credit. And you know, I think that, that memory, like the wolves, it's hard to be a wolf, it's hard to find food and they're amazing but they're also not just these like successful hunters, 10 out of 10. They're nine out of 10 chasing, right? Renowned wolf biologist David Meesh calls wolves one of the wildest and shyest of all the animals in the Northern wilderness. And I also think it's important to remember that the way we relate to wolves really depends on the way we are living beside them. So in Northeastern Japan in the 18th century, people are growing rice. And when the wolf came, it scared the deer away from the field. So people would thank the wolf. There are shrines to the wolf. There are statues about the wolf. And they would, you know, the wolf was actually helping their crops. And throughout history, traditionally shepherd cultures have feared wolves, whereas hunter cultures have revered the wolf. So wolf, the wolf is not like innately some human enemy. It's sort of structured inside the, the systems that we're living in. Okay, the second idea that I want to touch on is this idea of the lone wolf which got to me a lot because I see it so much in the headlines. And I think there's this conception that lone wolves are sort of the fiercest, scariest, that they're acting totally alone and they prefer to be alone. Once after a breakup, a boyfriend said to me, I'm just a lone wolf. And I think what he was implying was that, you know, he just was someone who always was gonna be alone. But that's actually wrong when you look at what lone wolves are in a wolf pack. It's really common for wolves to leave. It's called dispersal. And they go to find new territory, they go to find a new mate, they go to find a new pack, but they don't leave because they prefer to be alone. They're going out to find connection. And this is the most vulnerable time in a wolf's life. 
They can't hunt the same way. They're maybe eating roadkill. They're traveling long distances. So you're running up against cars and roads, right? And territorial disputes from other wolves. They're really at risk at this moment. This is a map of OR7, a famous wolf, the first wolf that had crossed into California and Western Oregon that I follow OR7's journey throughout the book. OR7 is leaving home around the same time I am, and I sort of weave our two stories. But this is, you can see the path of where this wolf traveled alone, over 3,000 miles. Like, this is a risky journey. And, you know, what makes a wolf go it alone? There's some research now that a single-celled parasite that is actually kind of works its way through cougar feces may be, it's a high predictor of whether the wolf is going to go off alone. So I just think this idea that human lone wolves um, are really dangerous, we're actually misunderstanding maybe not only just wolves in that situation, but also humans. Like what if we are to think in our human societies about lone wolves as actually vulnerable looking for connection? The last misunderstanding that I want to talk about briefly is this idea of the alpha wolf. How many of you have heard of the alpha wolf, referred to the alpha wolf, right? It's a pretty common idea. And it basically, you know, the term comes from the idea that wolves are fighting amongst each other to get to the top of the pack, that they're pretty chiefly competitive, and that it's this hard one, kind of office water cooler hierarchy is often the way it's, it's talked a lot about in office politics. And the phrase has roots in research done on captive wolves who were brought in from many different zoos and kept in a small pen. And if you think about it, that's kind of like studying a human family of just by looking at random people in a waiting room. How do they interact? Let's see about how human families interact. And in reality, the wolves in dominant positions in a pack are not there because they're the most sort of like fierce fighters. They're there because they're the oldest or they're the parents of the offspring, or they're the more charismatic sibling. And it's most common that wolves are fighting between packs, not actually within packs. And when you do see these fights within packs, or between packs rather, the wolf packs with older members are the ones that are doing better. And it's because those older members are bringing wolves together, they're easing panic, they're teaching. Wolves trade, like they teach skills to the younger generations. There's this amazing knowledge that is passed through them. And I think this just enforces this idea that wolf packs are supportive places, they're families. You know, wolves live in these incredible communal and collaborative, really multi-generational family structures. They help raise one another's youngs. Um, you know, biologists actually refer to wolf packs sometimes as having step-parents and siblings and foster families. And I think we have so much to learn from wolves who, how they live in caring and generous ways, not the fierce and competitive ways that we sort of predominantly think of wolf groups potentially being. Okay, so why is it especially important to separate fact from fiction with wolves? This is true for any animal. Every creature deserves to be seen for its scientific reality, untethered from our sort of projections on it. But at the same time, I think we have looked to wolves specifically as models for our own societies for thousands of years. You see this. Wolves are one of the most widely dispersed animals. They live, you know, they are in tidal flats, they're in deserts, they're on the Himalayan steppe. Wolves once roamed everywhere, and so many, many cultures have stories about them, right? And have looked to them as sort of models for our own life. And so when we're misunderstanding wolves, we're also misunderstanding ourselves very often. How can we reimagine these cultural narratives, right? These are three ways that these are sort of three misconceptions. But I also think we just have to think differently about our relationship with the wolf. New research shows that when a wolf is killed in a pack, maybe it's poached, maybe it's killed um, in, a, in an intervention because of it's been dep depredating um, on livestock, that might be the wolf that teaches others in that pack how to hunt. And when pack leaders are killed, sometimes you see packs disbanding. It's common to think about wolves in terms of population numbers, but to understand what it means to be a wolf is to think about a pack as a sort of like the social glue, the family. If you lose one wolf, you're, um, you're losing part of the social unit potentially. Wolves will pass on territory to their young. They're teaching this. And so if that pack is disbanding, you're losing that knowledge. And so thinking about wolves in this interconnected way, each pack is its own ecosystem, and each wolf has its own role in that pack. 
And you know, I wrote this book because I was thinking, OK, many people have fears. The people I was interviewing about wolves very often were talking about these fears they had about wolves or angers. And we often think, well, you just have to grow out of your fears. But I really thought, well, actually, how did you grow into your fears? And so many of the stories about the wolf are like the stories that are taught to children about fear. And so I think when we think about the importance of sharing our world with wolves, what we were really also thinking about is how are we sharing it with each other, both human and non-human. And so I will just end by saying I think we owe it not only to wolves, but to ourselves to tell new stories about how they live together. I'm excited to welcome up the other panelists. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, my name is Jackie Zupsik. I work for a firm called Tusk Strategies. We run regulatory campaigns. And one of the campaigns that we have run for the last couple of years is called the Relist Wolves Campaign, hashtag Relist Wolves Campaign. Um, and, and what that is, it's the coalition of advocates, of scientists, of researchers, of passionate people like yourselves who are pushing for the, for the federal relisting of, specifically, of the gray wolf. Um, so we're going to dig into some, some pieces, both about the wolf, about pieces of Erica's book, um, some research elements. Um, yes, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so with us, you've heard from two of these folks already, the wonderful Dr. Peter Kariva, who is the CEO and president of the Aquarium of the Pacific, Erica Berry, author of Wolfish, copies outside, once for, for purchase and for signing after the presentation today, and Elisiva Tate-Pullman, who is with the Coastal Commission now, but previously was here at the aquarium, um, <clears throat> excuse me, all of whom were part of the, are part of our Realist Wolves campaign. Great. So we'll get into it. We're going to take about 10 minutes doing this, and then we'll open it up to the rest of you if anyone else has, has questions for the panel. So my first question Zooming back to when you were a kid, do you have any, do you have a memory of what you thought, what, what do you think about wolves when you were growing up? What was your perception of them? Oh, so yeah, this is on. Mm -hmm. um, I had read the book White Fang, you probably know by Jack London, and, and uh, if you haven't read it, it's, it, it just, it's, it's about a wild wolf that sort of gets domesticated, but it's just a, an adventure story and a family story, and it's a really good story. But I was an East Coaster, and from that book, I just, every time I went outdoors, I wanted to see a wolf, but I never did, but I imagined them. I thought I saw them, but I, and you, you have in your book stories about people imagining they'd see them. I imagined I saw wolves in way, places I couldn't possibly see them. I should have known better, but that was my experience. I love that. Um, I had a, one of those embarrassing wolf t-shirts when I was young. I had a lot of photos in that. But I think that the moment that I first thought about wolves in this different way, it stands out when my mom got really sick one summer. I was in college, and she had this really spiky high fever. She was hospitalized. Nobody knew what was going on. And eventually, they bring in an epidemiologist who says she was bitten by a tick. She has a tick virus. And he makes this offhand comment, which is, we have so many more ticks because we have so many more rodents because the whole chain of the keystone species are gone, the predators are gone. If we had more wolves, maybe your mom wouldn't be sick. And it was a throwaway comment. He wasn't a scientist talking you know, specifically about ecology. But it was the first moment that I realized that wolves were connected to me in the ecosystem in this really cool way. And like they were not just out there as some like aesthetic bingo card thing to see, but actually their presence in the landscape had an implication for my own life. And so that stands out. Yeah, I would say that I, in my, my youth, which is much further than I'd like to admit, um, <laughs> there's two things that come to mind when I think about how wolves have impacted my life. The first would be Lisa Frank, um, yes. Many of you guys may have known. There's this like this really colorful and like really charismatic, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so pretty. I can add pink. I can add glitter. And then as I got older, I realized that that was a really big misrepresentation of the importance of predators like wolves and how they impact the ecology. 
And I was really fortunate in graduate school to get experience in how these species are really, they're vital for the ecosystems they're a part of and largely for the ecology that's connected to them. So I would say those are the two biggest moments in my, my wolf career thus far. Wonderful. Um, so let's, let's get into it. So Erica, you touched on this a little bit in your, in your presentation, but so much of the book talks about fear. Do you, you know, you, you even described at one point of the wolf as being a vessel for fear, which that was a really interesting comparison. Um, I mean, this is a big one, but why are people so afraid of wolves? Do you think it's justified? You know, I think so much of why people fear wolves is because we see ourselves in them. And I was thinking about uh, the idea of the nemesis. I don't know who here has ever had a nemesis. It's kind of fun to have a nemesis. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, like, it's, you have to have something in common with the creature that you are fearing or resenting. So what is the commonality we have with wolves? Well, they're very smart, they work together, they communicate collaboratively, they're raising their young, right? And I think, but unlike dogs, wolves, there's a familiarity with wolves. Oh wait, they should just wanna come over and hang out with us, but they don't. They're just doing their own thing. And I think there's something inherently threatening about that. We cannot, humans strive to control very often, especially Euro-American settler practices, strive to control the wilderness, right? And the wolf will not be controlled. And you know, there's this famous line, you're either with us or against us. And I think th there's perhaps a reflexive feeling that if the wolf is not the dog that is cuddling up at our feet, it's like out there and it doesn't care about us and we have a hard time wrapping our heads around that. Mm. I don't think the fear is justified. I forgot to answer part two. Good, love it. <laughs> and I have to ask this, because again, to your point of speaking about wolves at an aquarium, I think there's a lot of comparisons between the fear that we see that people are afraid of wolves and people are afraid of ocean creatures, big or small, from sharks to jellyfish. Um, you know, for, for folks that have this experience at the aquarium, what, what do you think about that? Well, you know, we hear, um uh, in, in some of these first Wednesdays, we've had uh, Chris Long from Cal State University Long Beach talk about sharks. There's a really good database from 1950 on great white sharks and the amount of attacks and, and kills in California. Whenever, when you see great white sharks, they, you know, they close the beaches and they do things like that. If you look at the data, you just get on Google and look at the data, recorded by decade, by decade, the number is Per decade, the numbers look something like two, zero, zero, two, one, zero, zero. That's the numbers. And if you think about the, how many millions of people are out there, you don't go to closing beaches. And very much like your biology stories, Chris Long at Cal State Long Beach has you know, followed them, tracked them, see what they have. Uh, they're not dangerous, but we are. They're dangerous if we do something foolish, but. Uh, it's so exaggerated. And the other thing I would just say, fear is almost never rational. It, just by definition, fear is an exaggeration. Right. I mean, at one point I remember seeing that people are more likely to die by, you know, falling vending machines than wolves, like by order, huge orders of magnitude, but we're not out there, like, attacking the vending machines. And I think it's important to keep those things in perspective. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I want to take a little bit of a shift. So, you know, regardless of the fear, perception versus reality, as many of you likely know, this year we celebrated the 50th um, anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, or the ESA. Um, you know, I, there's so much history in that 50 years, but Peter, I thought it'd be helpful to just do a quick, a quick touch up on, you know, how has the wolf benefited from the ESA over the past 50 years? So, um, you know, at, at one point the wolf was almost, totally disappeared from the lower 48 states. And now there's, you know, you could argue about it, there's somewhere between maybe 6,000 and maybe 8,000 wolves, maybe as low as 5,000. Certainly benefited and brought back to Yellowstone. But the, the ESA, it's, it's really, the ESA is an incredibly effective act. It's an incredibly, so it's not just the wolf that has benefited. Um, it's, uh, you know, the bald eagle, um, alligators, so many of uh, big animals that we feared have come back thanks to the ESA. Amazing. So 
just so everyone's on the same page about where we are with gray wolves today, what's the status of the gray wolf today? Do we know roughly how many, how many are left? How, how does this play with the, with the ESA as it stands? So, I mean, this is one of the things that people debate about is counting the exact number of, the, of wolves. And so in the scientific literature, I can't tell you what the number is because we don't share data that well and we don't have a good system. So it's somewhere between five and 7,000 that are left. And there's still uh, the big, de the reason we list wolves exist is because when they're delisted, they're denied protection. That's why relist wolves exist. When they're delisted, they're denied protection. And then in some states, denied protection is such a bland statement for what happens. They're slaughtered. And, and Erica, I mean, just thinking about the research that you did for this book, did you hear, did you hear people have a strong opinion one way or the other about whether wolves should be on the endangered species? on the list, what people thought of the ESA as a whole. I mean, I think you see just sort of on a policy level that where wolves have been protected, their populations are doing much better, right, when they're, where they're not. And I think we see the importance of that. Um, I, I don't know, I think so much about, you, we can't just conserve the wolf numbers, we also have to conserve their habitat. And the ESA really does such a good job of bringing up what are these larger uh, conservation of ecosystems and how do we think about conservation on this wider sprawling way, which maybe we'll talk about, but the ways that, um, yeah, it's so important. And it's something that is continually a wave that crashes and then we're refighting for it. I think we see that right now. Yeah. Elisiba, I know you wrote a paper, you were co-author on a scientific paper about, about wolf conservation. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you learned in this paper, what you, what you learned about big predators and, and wolves specifically. Yes, so kind of piggybacking on some of the statements that have already been made, um, as I was doing the research, one of the biggest issues I ran into was the data. There's no consensus on where to store it, how to store it, how to analyze it. And so that really leads to a very big problem in how to, how to find solutions. Because if you're working on a partial data set or a hard to access data set, that is going to lead to misconceptions. That's going to enhance the fear that we've been talking about this evening. So I think one of the first things, if I you know, had a perfect world, uh, would be having like a hardcore data set that's up to date, that's accurate as possible, and that's really traceable and transparent. That would eliminate, I think, a lot of the issues in the, the foundational part of analyzing conservation holistically. The second part of the research that I did was reaching out to folks and really getting a pulse on what is happening. I'm from California, so I've not had the fortunate experience of seeing a wolf, but there are thousands of ranchers and producers, uh, depredation managers that are on the ground every day having these lived experiences. And in those discussions, you could hear the frustration. <laughs> you could hear the fear. And their fear is valid because it's their experience, but I do believe that there's an element that is based in assumption. It's, you know, if I don't shoot them all, if I don't get rid of all the wolves, all my sheep are gonna, you know, they're gonna be wiped out. And we have resources that can help mitigate those problems, but people just don't feel like they're heard. So I think starting with an accessible, transparent data set, but also providing the resources and the spaces for these people with lived experiences to talk to the scientists, to talk to the researchers, to talk to the depredation management services would be a really big step in the right direction for everyone to find these sustainable and intricate solutions. It's not a, there's no blanket policy that's gonna solve this. It's not gonna change overnight. It's gonna take dedication, clarity, and listening to one another. You know, Nishmay, I just wanted to follow up on something that you said there, because I thought it was, and you know, I was obviously uh, talking to you a lot while you were making these calls and so forth and getting this. It's it, so to the individual rancher losing a sheep or, ca or cattle is, it's a big deal. I mean, it's a, it's a real loss and it's, it cannot be ignored. But for a policy decision, it's, 
the total mortality that, that counts and how you respond to it. So I'm a numbers guy. The way I like to think about it is if you're a cattle in the lower 48 states, you got about a between a two, maybe two and three out of 100,000 chance each year of being killed by a wolf. What if you're a child under five and taking a bath? What is your chance of drowning? It's about the same. But the reason I, I use that story is because there's no denying that to a rancher when a wolf kills one of their cattle, it's a real tragedy. Just if a child dry, drowns, it's even much more of a tragedy. But the response to it is, is the way you think about it is, well, how am I going to make it safe? Mm. That, that's how you respond to it. You don't just exaggerate it. Instead, I think that we need that, that response to the wolf problem is, it's not that great a mortality rate. So let's think about how we can make it safe because it's certainly feasible to do so with that low mortality rate. Sorry, go for it. <laughs> We're both very passionate, you can tell. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So yes, I I'd absolutely agree. I think that there is an, there's an inflation and it's because of the fear. Um, you know, I don't see people taping up their bathroom doors and saying, no baths for you because it's dangerous. Um, but the fear is based in the narratives we have. And so if you're, you know, a child growing up and they're, you know, oh, we don't have the cow anymore because this big bad wolf leading to the, the or alluding to the stories you were explaining um, came and ate it, that's going to enhance the fear. But like I was, um, I was trying to get to in my earlier statement, the data has to be clear. <laughs> the data is where we're going to see those long-standing changes. And I wish that there was a magical website that had all the states and all the, the information readily available. Um, but we're just, we're just unfortunately not there yet. And that was really frustrating uh, during out, throughout my entire um, data mining process. So I would love to be a part of initiatives and discussions to make that leap, because I think that if we get there, if we can even, if we can just start there and say, hey, this is how we're going to process this and analyze it and keep track of it, that would be, that would be amazing. Amazing. Yeah, the, the facts versus, the concept of facts versus fear or emotion versus science is something that we, we see a lot, we hear a lot when we're talking to people on both sides, on both sides of this issue. Um, okay, great. So, you know, as my last question before we open it up to the audience, for people that are listening today that, you know, might feel a spark of passion towards helping to protect wolves, what would you recommend? What's the first step? What's something someone can do to get involved or help? Other than go to realistwolves.org. <laughs> oh, I'll take a stab at this. Education is probably the best step. Um, there's so many resources, there's so many great books, there's so many experts that are more than happy to you know, be on a phone call, be on a Zoom call across the world. Um, just, there are resources. <laughs> you know, Google is a great resource to just start your own little pathway to becoming a little wolf conservationist. Like, we love that for everybody here and those who are joining online. So. Please don't be afraid to ask questions and just dive into the science, dive into the historical and cultural context. Um, and it's always a good time, I promise. Yeah, I'm just, I've been thinking as we've been talking about a time I spent with a rancher who was, she was gonna show me photos on her wildlife cameras for when wolves were on her property. And so these motion censored cameras, you know, they catch every time there's a big animal walk by. So we're going through it, she's finding a wolf and then it's like a cougar and that's three cougars and that's, a, like one wolf and then nothing, 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 and then four cougars. And we start going through and she's like, why am I not afraid of cougars? And she was just kind of like, what are, what are the folk tales about cougars? And I was like, I don't know, I can't help you. You know, like sitting down and actually thinking through and doing this kind of like mental inventory, I think was help, she was like the wheels were turning of like, I'm really afraid of wolves and yet I have one wolf and I have a, a hundred pictures of cougars here. And I'm not saying we should all be afraid of cougars, my goal is not to make you afraid of them but to just think about like doing that sort. So I guess I would say like besides the education, some of this sort of like thinking through for yourself, um, what are the associations you have and how can you get in someone else's shoes and think what is it like to be raising calves 
up in the mountains of the Sierra and you're worried about wolves and like there are resources to, you know, like you were saying, to sort of be, like empathy and listening is actually a pathway to, I think, under like living together, it sounds very corny, but it truly is. I guess I would take a more um, abstract and sort of cosmic <laughs> level being an ex-reformed academic, but um, I guess I would say open the conversation about, the, the nation really cares about species. It, uh, the, it gets caught up, it gets caught up, so much of our arguments about conservation are not about do we care about wildlife or animals, they're about federal government intrusion and stuff like that. But if you go back to the heart, if you talk to people of all lifestyles, of all politics, it's the fabric of our nation to care about wildlife, it's part of our identity. And then I think the question you use wolves to get to, so what is it that we want for our wildlife in North America? Let's have a little bit higher standard. It's, it's I, I shouldn't say this, but in some sense it's pretty easy to make sure that a species doesn't totally blink out on the planet. It's very hard to have a species behave in a more natural way in the wild so we can all experience it. And I think the Endangered Species Act was actually, had so much support. Remember, it had unanimous support. Every senator, almost every congressman, not a single dissenting, even word spoken when it was passed. So I think we ought to sit there and say, what do we want wildlife to be in North America? And use the wolves and our sea otters here and our sharks and all these other animals and say, Let's set the bar higher and want more of them, and let's really have some wildness in the world. I love it. All right, we're going to open it up for any questions in the audience. We've got two wonderful volunteers with mics, so please, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we'll come get a mic over to you. Great, we've got one in the front row over here. Here, I can give you this one. Yeah. So on social media, I've seen a few posts regarding wolves returning to their natural ranges. And the comments are very, you know, back and forth, people disagreeing on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. And I feel that we've seen a lot of environmental movements, I guess, go from a lot of people not caring to suddenly everybody caring. Do you anticipate a tipping point where this becomes far bigger than what it feels now when everybody starts to realize this is a big issue, or are we still a ways away from that? I would just share one. Um, there's new research that's come out that newspapers have fewer editorials that are about how controversial wolves are the longer that wolves have lived in that place. And so I do have some hope. You know, I started looking at wolf populations in Oregon about 10 years ago, and I heard journalists were getting death threats and all of this extreme amounts of danger. And it's not to say that those things aren't happening, but in Oregon, there's a lot of folks who are learning to live beside them and getting used to it. And you know, I talked to a rancher who's got an electric fence around his property that's helped paid for by conservation groups as well. And there's this kind of collaborative conservation models that are helping ranchers re-change their, pra their practices, train cows in different ways, have breed different kinds of cows that are actually better at standing up to wolves. So I do think that we're on this trajectory where more people are caring and we're learning to see that there are ways of living beside wolves which people have done for thousands of years. So I, I would have a hopeful answer to that question. Okay. I want to chime in on that one too because p part of what we're doing with the Realist Wolves campaign, a lot of it is a big social media push. So you know, we're trying to educate people. We're all sitting here in Southern California. We get this a lot too, by the way. You talk to a rancher in Idaho or Montana, who are you to say whether or not, who are, who are you sitting in Los Angeles to say what my experience is with wolves? Um, I think from the social media side of the house, the more that we can help people facilitate conversation and, and learn about facts versus fear to start really spreading that message. I mean, I, I'm really, 
maybe I'm naive, but I'm cautiously optimistic that that's, you know, ho hopefully really going to change things for us. Yes, you've got a question over here. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm, a, I'm an ecologist and artist myself, and I loved hearing all of your perspectives on like the stories that we tell about wolves. Um, and I am, so I love thinking about the stories that we tell about um, ecology in general, I suppose. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas on like, uh, like spaces or mediums or practices that you think have a lot of potential for building new, more constructive folklore, if that makes sense. Or, or like, if not, you know, like what have your most successful approaches been that you think have the most potential? Thank you. I'll take a, a crack at this one. Um, so we live in a very interconnected world Social media is a great up, uh, example of that. Um, so I, I, in my personal practice, I do use social media. Um, as the only scientist in my family, I also take opportunities to facilitate conversation in my shared spaces. So work, home, um, organizations, volunteer work. And I find that the quieter I am, once I pose a question, <laughs> the better because people are really passionate there there's just sometimes not the most there's not a lot of spaces where they feel comfortable and so I'll say hey you know did you read the paper did you did you read that article that I sent you a couple weeks ago and I'll just let them have this flow of consciousness that I find is very enriching for myself because I can hear where they're coming from and you know using those active listening skills but then I can kind of course correct when I hear something that's oh no they're super scary or, oh, no, that science stuff isn't working. And I'm like, well, you know, here's the data. So what do you think about this? So I personally think that one of the best uh, personal practices that I have been able to facilitate in my, my life is just active listening and really being up to, on the science, being up on the information and the cultural relevance and providing that space myself for others. Thank you for the work that you're doing in this field. I think it's so important. Um, and I think, you know, I'm a big proponent that arts that are more abstract can also give people a lot of room to speak, right? And this idea of uh, looking at visual, there's amazing, like I was looking at all these just wolf sculptures and paintings and what are the narratives that those bring up, you know? I think, um, I would also say that the listening is huge. The, the idea that you hear in collaborative conservation circles is the metaphor of barbed wire. Where when you think about barbed wire, you're thinking about the barbs, but so much of barbed wire proportionally is smooth. And so what are the things that you have in common with the person who thinks they, my uncle is an example, right? Where he has a sticker that believes something on his truck that I don't believe, but what do we both have? We both want to be able to hike the land. We both want, um, fewer livestock killed by wolves. We both believe in wild spaces that are protected and are not turned into condos. So finding those moments of smooth um, through listening, I think, is, is really important. And art can really help create those spaces. Uh, did you look at native narratives when you looked at this? Uh, they tend to be a little bit more positive. Absolutely, and it was really interesting because the Kalapuya, who lived near where my grandfather's sheep farm was, the predominant narrative, their creation story, is about wolves protecting the young and actually like strapping the, the little babies onto their backs. And you know, you look at that, and in Oregon, the first law that settlers passed, the first law that helped form the whole government was about putting a bounty on killing wolves. And so I just thought, you know, you just take this one patch of land and you have two different peoples with two completely different stories that are about nar uh, narratives about wolves that have huge implications. So yeah, I do think that those are really uh, models of stories of living beside wolves that we should all be looking to because there's a lot of lived experience there and folks in native spaces that are now involved in conservation, Deb Holland in government right now that are working to sort of center those perspectives, which is so important. Thank you. You mentioned, well, that's loud. You mentioned how wolves can relate to humans and we can learn from them. Are there any other animals that 
we can also learn from and relate to that share a similar connection? I love that question. <laughs> I, also, <laughs> I do too. I feel like I've taken up a lot of time. Does anybody else want to go first? Well, obviously here at the aquarium, I think we almost virtually every animal that you just observe takes you out of, part of it is taking you out of yourself. We have a tendency to be so self-centered and to just, I mean, you said it really well, to just try to, we all have our favorite, I love to watch kids come here and different kids have different favorite animals and they run to their favorite animal and, and I, I don't know what's going in their head, but I could run to my, my favorite animal happens to be octopus. And I, I just like to, like, I know how smart octopus is, and I like to watch them and just think about how they see the world. And it just makes you realize to try to understand how an animal lives and sees the world and interacts, it makes you less confident in a good way about how you see the world and being kind of a prisoner of your own biases. I was just going to say, I think there's a real challenge to look at like a coral and think, what can I learn about living in the world by this coral? Like wolves are very charismatic creatures. Not only do they look like dogs, which we're used to like sleeping beside every night, but they're just cute and cuddly. And like, look at the animals that seem the hardest, the most distant from you and think like, how does this creature adapting to say a more acidic ocean? What can I learn about adaptation myself potentially? And it, I just think, as an exercise, find the animal that is least like you and think, what can you yeah. find? Just quickly, Annette, like one of the favorite animals here for a lot of guests are jellyfish. Now, what do you think you get from jellyfish? Well, what you get is you watch them, and it's just so peaceful. Yeah. They, they just drift and float there. They don't expend any energy. They just are. It's nothing more zen than a jellyfish. <laughs> and they've got fear surrounding them, too, right? What an interesting thing. Um, so I am a very stalwart believer that the natural world has many lessons for all of us to learn, and that's a, on a continuous basis. So if I had to choose an animal that I would suggest looking into, it would be the troglodyte or the water bear. <laughs> there are these really tiny, itty-bitty microscopic creatures that can pretty much adapt to anything. They're, they're virtually unkillable. Um, we've sent them to space, we've frozen them, we've set them on fire. It's a lot of, a lot of weird stuff that we do to troglodytes. <laughs> but they're, they're a lesson in resilience and adaptability and being able to shift and move with the world around you as opposed to being so obstinate that you miss a lesson or that you miss a chance to grow. So if you're ever just bored on a, on a weekend, you know, look up troglodytes, they're really cool. Um, and I am biased because I, I like invertebrates, but they're, they're prime real estate for learning about adaptability. Hi, my name is Zoe Bong, and recently in my high school English class, we had a Socratic seminar analyzing this poem about wolves, and I couldn't help but notice the dichotomy of the opinions that all the students were talking about, like the conventional beliefs that Erica Berry shared before, like. A lot of people were talking about the fear and the wrath or the very irrational, like murderous intent of this cunning wild creature. But there was also a large portion of the class that talked about a very humorous side of the wolves. I found that Gen Z finds them very funny these days, especially with references to the Twilight movie or like the picture you showed in the, I think the second slide was like this image of a furry as we call it. And I was wondering if you guys think that this start of like a split in this public view when it comes to the Gen Z view, like do you guys think that's for the better or for the worse when it comes to wolf conservation? First, I love that in English class you're having a Socratic talk about a wolf poem. I wanna go to this English class. <laughs> um, you know, I think so many people sent me this wolf meme that's the inside of you, there are two wolves which I don't know, that just like, people were like, well, surely you have a chapter on this. It's so big on the internet. <laughs> and I think, I mean, part of what it makes me think is just, I think the more we are talking about wolves, this is a good thing. But like beneath that, it's very easy to have narratives that are like, wolves are my, the, the sort of, uh, in the 80s, it was like, wolves are the spirit animal. They will save all, everything. And on the opposite, it's like, wolves are villains. They will ruin everything. 
And in between, that's a sort of, I've heard conservationists talk about it as a pendulum model, that it leaves people out if you're on one of those sides. So what does it mean to settle into wolves are really important keystone species, and also so are these other creatures? And like, I'm not advocating that we should think less about how amazing wolves are. I clearly wrote a whole book about how much I love them and how amazing they are, but also what are the, um, yeah, just the thinking, when, when we tell the stories about the wolf, really thinking like, where is the science here? And what are these other, um, what am I trying to say when I'm telling a story about the wolf? Because it's probably about myself, very often. Those, that is telling more about my own relationship to wilderness or fear or how much I feel insecure and want to conquer some idea. And if we like tap in, this is where I think, like I wrote a book that I'm in it very much. I'm asking intimate questions about my own relationship with the wolf because I think that affects our language in big ways and we owe it to ourselves to like, yeah, do some of that reflection. Great, we've got time for about two more. Let's see one up here. Hi, it just doesn't seem logical or sensible that a species can be immediately killed once they reach their recovery goals. Is there any expectation from fish and wildlife of extended protection measures that a species has once they are removed from the endangered species list? And have we seen any other species that has had targets on their back immediately after delisting like we do with the wolf? That sounds like a, that sounds like a planted question. It's so perfect. <laughs> And, and uh, the number of people with relist wolves are, are doing that research because um, other species, we have other ways of protecting animals, the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And so uh, they don't, you don't have to be listed to have that protection. And, it, and we know they work really well. I think the whole deal with, with, with wolves and what happens is First of all, what we call recovery, we have a pretty low standard for saying wolves are doing well. So our standard there is, is we're, we're too easily satisfied to say that wolves are back. That would be mistake number one. Do you know for over one out of, the, somebody did a study of vertebrates and the goals for recovery. So when you're listed, the idea is you write a recovery plan and you delist them you remove the protection when they've reached a target. For one quarter of the species that were listed, the target for recovery was lower than the population when they were listed. Including a California condor. California condor was at 60 individuals when it was listed. The recovery plan said the goal for recovery is 50. So that's nuts, right? That's absolutely uh, nuts. So it's a combination of don't call them recovered and don't delist them so easily. And the second thing, once they are delisted, it's to everybody's advantage to extend protections. Otherwise, you're going to go back and forth in litigation. They'll be listed, delisted, listed, delisted. Nobody's happy with that. Got room. One more. Great. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. It was an amazing panel, an amazing book, um, just a really important discussion. But something I found really interesting was, you know, how the depletion of wolves is really actually um, closely tied to white colonization and the Americas. And I know we touched on it earlier, but indigenous groups um, have been known to kind of have this harmonious relationship with these wolves. And um, I, I was curious about if there are ways to kind of look to indigenous groups or, or groups of color, or Pacific Islander groups and, and groups like that and just how to um, better conserve nature and, and really protect these animals. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And for this is a huge, um, it's a huge part of the book because I, I just hadn't realized that the government foundationally of my home state was rooted in killing wolves and expunging wolves from the land, but also in the, the, of the same people that were voting on that were soon after voting on a black exclusion clause in Oregon. And I just began to realize that like this idea of what are the borders of who is allowed in and out, right? We think about those in terms of animals, but that has implications for humans as well. And like I think looking at wolf politics as we see with like this Central Park Five head like the ways we animalize humans and the ways we vilify hu animals 
there's a feedback loop there. And it's not like stories about nature and stories about say, social justice are different. They're not. And so I thank you for asking this. There are organizations. Um, there's a lot. I would say like I'm not as familiar with groups down here, but doing research, you know, there's a number of groups in Eastern Oregon where I did work where actually people are giving the land back to the tribes and they are managing that property and um, thinking about how can how are wolves here. The Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon, you have more wolves hanging out there. That's just where they are. They're not on other places of property. And so more people are going, okay, what is the conservation connection here, right? Um, indigenous lands across the world hold a, some huge proportion, I wish I had the number right now, of how many species are on those lands, right? So um, does anyone have a local organization? I am... Not one in particular, but there are a number of tribal councils that are active and have social media platforms, websites, um, and they, they're very well curated. And again, people are more than happy to talk to you and, and just really open those doors of communication. But I do agree that there is, there's a distinction between the us versus them mentality of many modern practices and the us and them mentality of traditional knowledge. So thank you for highlighting that point. That's been a pretty core pillar of, of our Relist Wolves campaign as well. We have a, a gentleman, his name is Kevin Alice, who I, if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to connect you with, who's really focused on, on that aspect, especially as with, with tribal consultation more generally at the federal level, which is obviously so incredibly important. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you guys so much. Just a couple of really quick housekeeping things. So the next First Wednesday is going to be on April 3rd. It's focused on Peter's favorite animal, octopus. Um, so that should, be, that should be a lot of fun. Um, now we'll, we'll break, and there are basically two areas you can go. You can go up the stairs. We've got one gallery. The babies exhibit is, is open for viewing. That's up the stairs or down the stairs. Erica will be down here selling her books where she'll also sign them for you. We've got the, the bar. Everyone should have received a free ticket for a cocktail or mocktail on Realist Wolves. Um, and we look forward Forward to chatting with all of you. Thank you so, so much for everyone for making all of this happen. Thank you. And listen to the howls. <laughs>